Beirut is the most westernized of all Arab capitals. The evidence of the French colonial period here is as stark as it is in Quebec. In the days of the French, Beirut was a Mediterranean tourist paradise. Still there are traces of this slowly disappearing past splendor. But as surely as the Middle East turmoil keeps away the tourists, it keeps away the business too. Especially the banking business that had made Beirut the financial capital of the Middle East. Now the Lebanese army has tanks and armored cars permanently stationed on the footpaths outside all bank buildings in the capital. Taking the place of the timid business executive in Beirut, a new business has developed. Revolution. Palestinian revolution. Palestinian guerrillas in Beirut are not like the Viet Cong. Here they're in no way illicit. They're totally legitimate. In Beirut's main street, the biggest guerrilla movement has a three-story office building complete with all amenities. It's as modern as any in Sydney. But the machine gun toting guerrillas standing guard outside told me no photos and there was no arguing. Of the 11 Palestinian guerrilla movements, the most radical of all is the Popular Front for the Liberation of Palestine, the PFLP. The Popular Front is now so well organized that it even has its own daily newspaper with a claim daily circulation of 23,000. It was the Popular Front that hijacked and blew up three jet aircraft at Revolution Airport in the Jordanian desert. And it was the Popular Front that dynamited the Pan-American Jumbo at Cairo. The Beirut leader of the Popular Front is Ghassan Kanafani. He was born in Palestine but fled in 1948, as he puts it, from Zionist terror. Since then he's been plotting the destruction of both the Zionists and the reactionary Arabs. I know what I know Thank really you. that uh, the history of the world is always the history of weak people fighting strong people. Of weak people who has a correct case fighting strong people who use their strength to exploit the weak. Turn to the fighting that's been going on in Jordan in the recent weeks. It's your organization that's been one side of the fight. What has it achieved? One thing that we have a case to fight for. That's very much. This people, the Palestinian people, prefer to die standing than to lose its case. We achieved, we achieved proving that the king is wrong. We achieved proving that this nation is going to continue fighting till victory. We achieved that our people could never be defeated. We achieved teaching every single person in this world that we are a small, brave nation who are going to fight to the last drop of blood to put justice for ourselves after the world failed in giving it to us. This is what we achieved. It does seem that the war, the civil war, has been quite fruitless. It's not a civil war. It's a people defending themselves against a fascist government, which you are defending because just King Hussein has an Arab passport. It's not a civil war. Well, a conflict. A it's not a conflict. It's a liberation movement fighting for justice. Well, whatever it might be best called. It's not whatever, because this is where the problems start. Because this is what makes you answer all your questions, ask you all your questions. This is exactly where the problems start. This is a people who is discriminated, is fighting for his rights. This is a story. If you will say it's a civil war, then your questions will be justified. If you will say it's a conflict, then of course it's a surprise to know what's happening. Why won't your organization engage in peace talks with the Israelis? You don't mean exactly peace talks, you mean capitulation, surrendering. Why not just talk? Talk to whom? Talk to the Israeli leaders. That's kind of conversation between the sword and the neck, you mean? Well, if there were no swords and no guns in the room, you could still talk. No, I haven't been, I had never seen any talk between a colonialist case and a national liberation movement. But despite this, why not talk? Talk about what? Talk about the possibility of not fighting. Not fighting for what? 
not fighting at all, no matter what for. Yeah, and people usually fight for something, and they stop fighting for something. So you can't tell me even why should we speak about what? Well, stop fighting. Fight for what? Or, or talk about stop fighting why? Talk to stop fighting to stop the death and the misery, the destruction, the pain. The misery and the destruction and the pain and the death of whom? Of Palestinians, of Israelis, of Arabs. Of the Palestinian people who are uprooted, thrown in the camps, living in starvation, killed for 20 years, and uh, forbidden to use even the name Palestinians. They're better that way than dead, though. Maybe to you, but to us, it's not. To us, to liberate our country, to have dignity, to have respect, to have our mere human rights, is something as essential as life itself. You call King Hussein a fascist. Who else amongst the Arab leaders are you totally opposed to? We consider the Arab governments two kinds. Something we call reactionaries, who are completely connected with imperialists, like uh, King Hussein government, like Saudi Arabian government, like Moroccan government, Tunisian government. And then we had some other Arab governments which we call the military petit bourgeoisie governments. That's like Syria, Iraq, Egypt, Algeria, so on. Just to end with, let me go back to the hijacking of the aircraft. On reflection, do you think that is now a mistake? We didn't make a mistake in hijacking them. The contrast. We did one of the most correct things we ever did.